How long does it take to tell a story? How about one sentence? Welcome back to Text to Nation. I'm Fred Fishkin. Joining us is author Gary Lipman. Hi, Gary. Hi there, Fred. How are you today? Terrific. Well, your latest work is titled, We Love the World But Could Not Stay, a right. collection of one-sentence stories. One sentence. We'll get yeah. to that in a minute. First, uh, Gary, tell us a, a little bit of background about yourself here. I understand you have a law degree. I have a law degree from Northwestern University, and uh, I'm going to my law school reunion this weekend, 30, 30th year. So uh, I'm looking forward to seeing old friends. I practiced um, for somewhere uh, at somewhere called the Innocence Project where we would use uh, DNA evidence to exonerate innocent people when we believed they were innocent. I did that for a long time, uh, uh, part-time at times, but um, was really into that. But all the while I was very interested in writing. So I did some, I did journalism along the way and did travel writing for photos and always wanted to write fiction. So a few years ago, I published my first novel which is a dark Hollywood saga called Set the Controls for the Heart of Sharon Tate. And uh, following that, I wanted to try something very different. And I hatched the idea of writing one sentence stories. I'd always been a fan of short, short stories and thought I'd like to try my hand at it. And when I was beginning, I thought, you know what, let me have a unifying thing here. And uh, so I decided on the one sentence idea asking myself, how much story can I fit into one sentence? And uh, the results are in my new book. And uh, there's a, I guess, a, I don't know if it's subtitle, Stories for People with a Limited Attention Span. <laughs> right. Per yeah. Sounds perfect for our TikTok world, doesn't it? It does, yeah, unfortunately. My other joke about the book is, if you don't like one story, the next story is only half a sentence away. <laughs> That's terrific. Do you have some favorites here? I mean, th there's quite a variety here, and you do take uh, I, uh, liberties, I guess, in saying one sentence because some are are on the long side for for one sentence, not long stories. But yeah, I decided. I decided. You know, many of them are short, uh, as you'd expect, but many are very long because I wanted to push the um, the envelope, so to speak, or push the period away. Uh, so I use semicolons and a lot of commas. In fact, a friend of mine said to me uh, when I told her that I was doing one sentence stories, she immediately figured out that I was going to break some rules, grammatical rules. So she said, oh, so I bet you're using commas instead of periods to tell these stories. Busted. She got it right. Um, but uh, a lot of this, the longer stories are among my favorites, but a lot of the shorter ones, too. So, you want to uh, you want to share some of the some of the sure. favorites you, you write about your dad once in a while I hear too. <laughs> yeah, my dad's in there a lot. Uh, my mom, I I usually uh, I found that what I would often do is about one third of the stories are autobiographical, taken from my life or taken from stories I've heard from friends. Another third of the stories are purely invented, just used my imagination and went to town. And uh, the next third, maybe the biggest of the three, biggest third, so to speak, a little more than a third, are stories that started out as autobiographical, true to life, but which I then set my imagination loose on them and changed things. So um, I went to town, you know, changing, changing uh, the reality, giving it a twist at the end or changing the location, changing, um, you know, the, the, the characters, et cetera. And so, uh, so an some can get a little on the quirky side. Yeah. Well, here's one of the quirkiest and a very short one, which starts the book. And this was one of the first stories I wrote. This is purely imaginary, as you'll understand. Um, it just was a kind of musing I had. This one, which begins the book, is called Moonburn. And it goes, you woke to find the full moon on your cheek neatly balanced as if it belonged there but you mistook it for a pimple and you popped it <laughs> that's terrific so tell me i mean this writing is so different 
I suppose, from any other kind, the whole process where if you if you're developing characters or whatever that that you have to continually add to the story and and build on it with these you sit down and you have something germinating in your head you write it down and then you can leave for a while and come back exactly exactly i would usually you know i've heard it said that short stories even very long short stories ideally should be written in one sitting the first draft that is and can be read in one sitting where your attention is unbroken essentially and or ideally and uh Unlike a novel, it's something that you take in at once, much like a poem. Uh, this was an extreme example of that because I would have an idea. For example, the, the very short story I just read, I just got an idea of the moon uh, settling on your face. I don't know where that came from, maybe in a dream. And then it just, my imagination took over and I thought, well, where does, what would it feel like to have that? And then I thought, you know, it might be mistaken for a really big pimple. And what do you do with pimples? And there I was, there was the story, you know, and when I looked at it after writing it, I thought, I like that. And I think a lot of times with writing, you either capture a memory, as I said, create something out of your imagination or do a mix of the two. And once you get it down, you like it or not. And the ones I liked, I would then revise. This one obviously didn't take a lot of revision because it's so short, just moving a few words around. And um, the idea is that the reader will read it and smile or feel a tinge of sadness because a lot of the stories are not silly like the one I just read, but sad or philosophical. Um, and so- Tell, tell uh, me, I, I mean, with some, there are, there are some- I suppose, lessons that you're trying to convey here once in a while. I like, the, for instance, the, the one about your your father in, in flight school uh, right. or yeah. pilot training. Yeah, I, I don't have that one right to hand, but that's an absolutely true story. My dad told me when I was a kid, he, was a, he wanted to be a pilot in World War II, but he ended up crashing the test plane, you know, the, the practice plane, that they had him in during um, his first uh, flight. Fortunately, he you know wrecked the plane pretty much, but he didn't uh, get hurt. And his instructor who was next to him didn't get hurt. And my father abashedly turned to his instructor, who was a guy from the deep south. My father's name was Bud, Buddy. And Buddy, my father turned to the flight instructor sheepishly when he crashed the plane, knowing that he was now not going to be able to take another plane he was done he was not going to be a pilot because you crash the plane you know you washed out you're not you're not moving ahead i guess my dad did something wrong so he turned to the uh, instructor and shrugged and said i guess that was a bad landing and the instructor said to him bud any landing or no my father i'm sorry my father said i guess that wasn't a very good landing and the instructor said to him, Bud, any landing you walk away from is a good landing. So my dad uh, got the hope, well, maybe, but no, he was washed out. He was not going to continue uh, as a pilot. He ended up working as a radar operator in fighter planes, where I asked him if that was dangerous. And he said, you know, no more danger. You know, it's danger to everybody on the plane if you get shot down. But there was one job on a fighter plane that was more dangerous than the others, which was the gunner, because he had the open area where the gun, you know, where he could, sure. he needed the room to maneuver the heavy gun. And so they would always, the enemy planes would aim their artillery, you know, their fire at him, the gunner. For obvious reasons, he was easy to get. And of course, you know, they wanted to stop him from gunning. So my father said they had a very high fatality rate, the gunners. Right. On and, and, the, and the lesson in, in that story that you told, obviously, is any landing you walk away from <laughs> is good. Exactly. Yeah, well, it's, a, it's actually a really beautiful way to think about life, you know, not just airplanes, airplane situations, but, you know, have a little perspective. If you lose your job or lose your spouse, 
it's pretty bad, but you've walked away from that, right? You can find another job, you can find another spouse, ideally. So it's not quite the end of the world. Yeah. And then when you talk about being autobiographical, you you talk about uh, there's a story about New Year's Eve at Lake Opatcong and the, and the <laughs> legend there. Yeah. Yeah, that, that one I say there's a, um, well, that's not, well, yeah, that's interesting. I'm glad you mentioned that one. That story, let me, I don't want to, I don't know quite, can't remember quite where that is. Um, the gist of it is, it's so short, I could sum it up. The gist of it is, um, there's a legend that every New Year's Eve, an angel rises from the depths of Lake Hapatkong, which is, of course, a local lake for New Jerseyans. Or uh, it's in, it's in Jersey or Pennsylvania. Now I that's can't a, That's in New Jersey. Yeah. It's in Jersey. Yeah, I thought so. So it, it the, there's a legend that every um, uh, New Year's Eve, an angel rises from the depths of Lake Hapakon and asks the first person the angel sees, does Gary Lippman still worry too much about what other people think about him? And when the angel hears the answer, yes, the angel shakes its head ruefully and sinks back into the lake for another year. <laughs> well, we, we, we're thinking pretty highly of you. And the book has won some pretty interesting praise, too, from some well-known people. Yeah, I was very uh, fortunate to have blurbing the book, praising the book, printed on the back cover, is a blurb from uh, the great multimedia artist, the great... Um, Mu uh, songwriter, music figure, writer, painter. She's a quadruple threat as an artist, Lori Anderson, who wrote, um, I love short stories and these are the shortest ones I've ever read. And yet they have all the elements of my favorite shorts, amazing characters, compelling situations and beautiful cliffhangers. So I was really happy to hear that from Lori. I also got a blurb from Tom Robbins, the great novelist whose work I really love too, as I do Laurie's, who um, wrote, of course, Even Cowgirls Get the Blues, one of my favorite novels. Also two actors, uh, Lorraine Bracco from The Sopranos and Goodfellas, and Matthew Reese, the star of the television show Perry Mason, and also... Um, the Russians, uh, no. Or, or, yeah, the Americans. Or the Americans. Yeah. <laughs> well, Fantastic they were the Russians. Show. They were yeah. the Russians in the well, Americans. Yeah, <laughs> that's a great show. I highly recommend to everybody. Of course, um, everybody knows about uh, The Sopranos, but uh, The Americans, which ran a few years ago for several seasons, was a, a, a beautiful show about a married couple played by Matthew Reese and his real-life partner, Carrie Russell. Uh, they play... Russian KGB agents in the 1980s who were implanted here years before the 80s to seem like ordinary, everyday Americans, uh, but actually they're KGB agents doing espionage and sabotage while pretending to be this happily married husband and wife with children. And uh, there's an FBI agent who lives nearby on their tail um, not realizing that his neighbors are the very people, the KGB agents who he's pursuing. So Matthew was kind enough to give me a blurb, as did the others, and uh, and I really appreciated that. Very well done. So both the, both that series and the book. So thank you. Tell, yeah. Tell tell us where people can go to for more information about you and the book. Well, I have a website, Gary Lipman Official. And all the social media stuff is, uh, you know, Twitter, Facebook, Instagram are under that, uh, that name, Gary Lippman Official. My book can be found in the better bookstores and uh, in some Barnes and Nobles and uh, a lot of independent bookstores who, of course, I support. We want to help our independent bookstores as much as we can. And it's available online as well on Amazon, Barnes and Noble uh all the all the target all the main uh websites terrific and we're going to add this for people who are listening it's lipman is l-i-p-p-m-a-n right. gary thank you so much for spending time with us thank you fred i enjoyed speaking with you <laughs>